What do you think of your college hosting the rescue documentary? Oh, I think it's tremendous because it's, it's rescued and it's really going to be up to young people to make sure that Haiti stays in the face of the American public and that is held, this is held on a college campus, I think, really gives, says a lot about the commitment of, of the school and students. And welcome. Good. I heard a strong good evening. Good evening, everyone. Great. Wonderful. And welcome to York College to this evening's event. I just want to really offer a word of welcome and greetings from our students, from our faculty, and from our staff. Clearly, the, the screening we will see this evening and the conversation is something that we are all very interested in. All of you remember January 12th, and those of us in this part of this community with a strong Haitian population remember the devastation that we saw on that day. Certainly you remember where you were. This evening, I'm very delighted to welcome back to York College someone who seems to be really becoming our friend because last year she spent some time with us as we honored our famed Tuskegee Airmen. And so we're delighted to welcome you back tonight, Ms. O'Brien, to hold a panel and to do a screening on this very, very important and somber, if you will, occasion. So, Ms. O'Brien, the mic is yours. Please come forward and take us through the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Soledad O'Brien. We uh, first and foremost truly appreciate your hospitality. It is great to be back and, and, um, and I'm so pleased to be at, at York because I know that after we show a little clip of this documentary we'll have some great conversation about what's happening in Haiti and this is a topic that is so important to so many people. Uh, tonight we're going to show you a short pieces, three acts of our documentary that's going to air next Saturday, so on May 8th. And um, So you'll see half of it and then you'll have to wait till May 8th to watch the other half. Really, we just want to give you a taste of the story that we felt was very important to tell, the story of two orphans, Cindy and Mackinson. And as a journalist who went to Haiti to cover the breaking news of this massive and devastating earthquake, we could not help but be haunted by the plight of so many of Haiti's children, and we felt it was an important story to tell in a documentary. And so our story rescued is the story of these two orphans, but by extension, of course, the story of all of Haiti's children. And even though Dr. Keyes used the word somber, I would prefer to think of it as very hopeful. We've raised so many issues. I have want to invite our panelists to come up because there are a lot of topics we need to, to cover. Uh, first, Dr. Ron Daniels is a veteran social and political activist, a history and African American studies college and university professor who ran as an independent candidate to the president, uh, presidency of the United States in 1992. He serves as the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, an organization dedicated to the protection of the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of the Human Rights and the National Rainbow Coalition. He was the deputy campaign manager for Jesse Jackson's presidential bid in 1988 and has been lecturing about civil and human rights across the nation for the last 30 years. He's focused most of his international work on Haiti through the Institute of Black World 21st Century and the Haiti Support Project and has been analyzing U.S. policy and political trends toward the island as he works right here. He holds a B.A. in history from Youngstown State University, an M.A. in political science, and a Ph.D. in Africana Studies from Union Institute in Cincinnati. I'd like Dr. Daniels to come up and join us. Bishop Joel June was born and raised in Haiti. He's the son of the Bishop Ramu June. He's a pastor of one of the largest churches in the country with a congregation of over 3,000 members and is also the founder and president of the Haitian Pastoral League. He hosts a radio show that's heard in party 
uh, Haiti and parts, rather, of the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Jamaica, and the Bahamas. He and his wife, Doris, uh, founded Grace International in 1974, and since then, his organization has left a mark in the lives of Haitians through the management of 270 churches, 65 schools, three orphanages, a medical clinic, a hospital, and a home for elderly widows. Through these programs and facilities, Grace International also runs a feeding program and several learning centers. The base of the organization's work in Haiti is Grace Village in Carrefour, uh, which is west of Port-au-Prince. Before the earthquake, it was one of the, the toughest parts of western Haiti where the living conditions were some of the most precarious. Over 90% of the people in Carrefour were unemployed and had a uh, few economic activities to improve their living conditions. We'd like to invite Bishop jo June to come up and join us, please. And Dr. Mark Wade is a pediatrician, but in the course of his career as a physician, he's treated thousands of people through the Arise and Walk Ministries Foundation, a Christian nonprofit he founded back in 2001. The organization has treated over 75,000 people, distributed millions of dollars worth of medicines and medical supplies, and provided financial support for the global missions of over 50 churches and ministries. Dr. Wade has personally traveled on more than 50 medical mission trips to developing countries on five of the seven continents. He's been recognized for his global medical missions work by the National Medical Association, where he is now a member of the Executive Committee of the Board of Trustees. He received their Humanitarian Award in 2001. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Wade, would you please come up and join us as well? As we wait for Dr. Wade to, to join us and sit, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to talk about the work that you're doing in Haiti today. And, and what was the first thing you thought when you'd heard that a massive earthquake had struck an island that was already in such precarious shape? Well, I've been doing work uh, in Haiti for the last 15 years um, uh, from the African-American side. And I say that because um, my view is that African-Americans have not sufficiently understood Haiti's history, its culture, and our unique debt to it. Uh, we do a range of things there. Primarily, we have something called a Model City Initiative in the northern part of the country, uh, which is uh, Cape Haitian and Milo. Uh, we want to use cultural historical tourism as a basis for people-based economic development. Uh, and so we focused there for the last uh, five years, uh, supporting schools, hospitals, uh, health clinics, and the infrastructure there. Uh, actually, I was on my way to Haiti on uh, January 12th. I was scheduled to get a 6.45 a.m. flight the next day uh, to Haiti uh, because we were looking at doing a project to encourage people to go to the Citadel, uh, working with the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line, when the earthquake uh, struck. Uh, and so now we, of course, are focused on relief uh, recovery and reconstruction efforts, uh, uh, again, focusing on attempting to get uh, particularly African Americans and other people of African descent to be involved in the process of uh, redeveloping Haiti. How about you, Bishop? Yes, uh, Grace International uh, is a ministry that my wife and I founded uh, since 1972. Uh, the need was children because my wife was raised uh, in uh, an orphanage since she was five days old, and so she had such a love for children, which I didn't want to do myself. But uh, so our work in Haiti has been uh, mainly, I mean, most of part with children, and uh, we also uh, have been called to preach the gospel which uh, we oversee 270 uh, uh, church, churches. And uh, we have, like you said, the schools and uh, the feeding programs. But what happened on January 12th is very overwhelming because that brought over 25,000 people on our ground that we have to care for including close to uh, 10,000 children. So this, uh, the work we have had to do was rescue, and uh, rescue them under the debris, rescue them, you know, wherever they were, put them on the tents and tops and uh, sheets, you know, everything like that. 
and now then the relief work which include food and water and all of that and now working towards getting them out of the tent to relocate them to temporary housing and then permanent housing and then to a development type of life, a sustainable type of life where they will never be where they were before the hurricane, I mean before the earthquake, but they will be able to support themselves, support their families, and uh, make Haiti a better Haiti. Dr. Wade. Yes, and, and for me now, 27 years out of residency, uh, 15 of my years in addition to my domestic work uh, as a pediatrician focusing on, the, focusing on the most difficult end of the pediatric spectrum here, children in child welfare, um, juvenile justice. Uh, I've done 15 years worth of uh, medical missions work, have traveled around the world many times. And for the past 10 years, Arise and Walk, which I founded with my wife, has focused on bringing medical care to the neediest of the needy, along with the gospel, because the, we are a faith-based faith organization. Uh, I am a ordained minister and pastor, associate pastor at uh, True Vine Christian Center in Jersey. So having gone to the tsunami and having gone to uh, Southeast United States when Hurricane Katrina hit, when I heard about the earthquake in Haiti immediately, I believe the Lord told me to go to Haiti. And so we gathered ourselves and went and was divinely connected with Grace International. And so we came to Carrefour, which was the epicenter of the earthquake, uh, with the intent of providing um, relief, rescue and relief medical care. Um, that being, I gave an initial commitment that we would go the first week of each month for six months, which we've honored and will continue um, going back again on Monday and then the first week of June. But after that first trip in January, it became clear that the provision of medical care alone was not enough. And so we have, I had the opportunity to partner with uh, Pastor Jim Tyree and an organization called Boat Cutters, and together we've developed a, a restoration redevelopment plan that will move people from poverty and homelessness to temporary housing, permanent housing, job training, education, and prosperity in a matter of months, not years. It's a program that's in operation in other parts of the world, so it's not something we think might work. We know it work. it'll work. And so we were, we were connected with Bishop Grace and, and Grace International, where there's a ministry of trust, respect, and a history of support to the people of Haiti. And so we think we have a wonderful opportunity now to use Grace International as the demonstration project, if you will, of a sustainable redevelopment initiative that hopefully can be replicated throughout the country. One of the most painful things for me to see was the moment when Cindy almost cringes when her mother reaches out to touch her. And as a mother, it, it breaks your heart. And, and I wonder to what degree is the underlying poverty and desperation connected to this, the, what we see unfold in terms of the number of orphans and children who are abandoned and, and parents who come in and out of their children's lives. Can you frame the issue for us? Well, I think that's the, the important thing for people to always to understand is that uh, what you see in terms of the tragedy of the children of Haiti is a tragedy of Haiti in general. And here's a nation uh, which the world should have celebrated because of uh, the enormous accomplishment of, uh, of uh, the first enslaved people ever in history to have overthrown their slave masters to, increase, to create an independent republic. Um, in fact, uh, properly understood, America should have seen Haiti as a special neighbor. Haitian troops fought, fought in the Battle of Savannah. Uh, indeed, this country was doubled in size because of the Louisiana Purchase, which would not have been possible had it not been for the Haitian Revolution. Uh, but instead of that, what we've seen historically is Haiti being isolated, marginalized. The United States, well, France first extracted 150 million gold francs uh, in reparations. The United States invaded in 1915, stayed till 1934, has been on the wrong side over and over again. 
but also the policies have been on the wrong side. When you look at a city like Port-au-Prince Port that was built for 200,000, 250,000 people, I mean, the tragedy is, and that does not include Calfor, three million people, perhaps four million in the total environs of, of Port-au-Prince. And a part of that's because the United States, instead of supporting Haitian farmers, undermined Haitian farmers in terms of rice and sugar and various other things. There was this whole false notion that the manufacturing sector would be the, the, the dream, if you will. It turned, not out, turned out not to be the dream. And so you had just people coming by the literally millions to Port-au-Prince. And so you really have to understand that as the backdrop, this, uh, this horrific poverty uh, in Haiti. And I say impoverished because if the United States had had the proper engagement as well as the rest, the rest of the world, Haiti would not be in the situation it is now. Now that does not say that, doesn't mean that Haiti doesn't have its internal contradictions. It certainly does. I mean, the problems is an elite that uh, you know, controls most of the, the land and the, cult and the, and the res uh, wealth and resources. But the United States all too often has been on the side of that elite as opposed to the side of the vast majority of the people. So again, the problem of the children, which will be solved and which we must solve moving forward, has to be seen within that context. And policies moving forward, both in terms of the United States and Haiti, the Haitian government, must take that into account. One of the things I found very compelling about the lighthouse specifically was their um, philosophy of not adopting children out. Their philosophy, and in fact the title for our documentary was they feel like they are, their job is to help the children so they can rescue their own nation. That Haiti cannot be built from the outside but must actually be rebuilt from the inside. There is a range of how orphanages handle that issue of adoption and philosophy. Can you explain that range of, of options for us, Bishop? When I uh, married my wife, we were very young, and since she was an orphan, she was telling me we need to help the children. I said, okay. And I said, how? She said, we can have an orphanage. I said, no, <laughs> because the situation I was seeing there was people would have orphanage and have the kids until they are 16 years old, and then turn them and the street again with no education, no job capacity and nothing. So I said, no, I'm not going to involve in that. But I got involved after a big hurricane. We went to the south, to so Saint Jean du Sud, and I saw so many children, you know, and I was resisting with that. But I mean, I feel inside that I had to do something. God was, you know, compelling me to do that. So I took 15 children home without telling my wife because she stopped asking me for helping children in orphanage uh, after seven years we were married. Now, 12 years after we were married, I brought 15 children home. So she didn't know what to do. She said, take them back. I said, no, you ask for an orphanage <laughs> since we got married. And discussion, take them back. I said, no, you, you ask for an orphanage. So I left for one hour. And when I come back, I saw her cutting sheets. And, and uh, we, only, we had four boys, and I bought 15 girls. So she was cutting everything she could find to put clothes on them. These children through the help of many people, we raise them and the way we feel God wants us to raise them. We give them education. All of the big ones have been through colleges, to Kiskeya universities. <clears throat> <clears throat> and some of them have been sent to Jamaica, to Canada and to the States, and many of them come back and now they are bank managers and uni banks. They are doctors, some of them working with doctors without borders now. They are teachers and they are all of that. So what we are doing is empower the nation. We don't believe in taking them out just to take them out, but to stay in and make a better Haiti. So this is what I, my, our concept for take the children out there but if you cannot make them better, make their society better, just don't take them. Just food is good, but food is not enough. So that's what we've been doing.
I think that um, uh, Bishop June hits on a very critical point, and we at the Haiti Support Project are working on something called the Oasis Institute, which is predicated on the same set of principles. Because what we, when watching television, we saw so many of Haiti's children coming out and a tremendous rush by people to take the children out. And so we began to, to figure out how perhaps black people could get involved in this also, because quite frankly, what we saw mostly were people who were non-Haitians and non-people of African descent who were involved. And so we have pulled together seven black adoption agencies, the, all of all seven black adoption agencies that engaged in the process. But what we began to look at was really what we should be focusing on is not adoption as the first option, that the first option really should be, as the bishop says, to keep the children of Haiti in Haiti within the context of their culture, their history, provide wraparound services, counseling, and a first-class education so that they become the new leaders, the new engaged citizens and leaders of the future. So, and I think we do need those prototypes because unfortunately in Haiti, not all of the orphanages are quite as, as good as Bishop June's are. I mean, frankly, in Haiti, many, not many, some of the orphanages are businesses and they, and, and they are enterprises, uh, which really are not, are not, some of them are a little more than glorified babysitting services, frankly, where kids don't really get taken care of that well. So we really need models so that they can be replicated and hopefully the government will then take these models and incorporate it into its social welfare policy because that's one of the other issues that has to be looked at is the systemic nature of this uh, in terms of uh, what the reconstruction policy will look like. Dr. Lee. Yes, un unfortunately, poverty and persecution is, is a global phenomenon. And so Haiti is not unique to that. And regardless of the circumstances uh, that result in, in an environment in which one grows up in poverty and without, uh, we, we, in agreement with what the other two gentlemen have expressed, we, we at Horizon Walk see rescue not as removing one from the challenges of their life circumstances, but rescuing the vision, the opportunity, and the training so that they can not only become individually successful, but transform the community and the circumstances in which they have grown. And so our, our work in looking for opportunities to, to combine with, with people and organizations and ministries of vision. You see, we, we recognize maybe a little different than, than many, um, I'll say Western uh, organizations and ministries who, who see that, that God has given us great vision and where to go and save people beyond our borders. Uh, we, we believe that, you know, God might just have given somebody in a foreign land a vision as well. And our role is to come alongside of them like the Holy Spirit and help them to manifest that which God has told them to do. So when we bring resources and personnel, finances, and pour into those organizations like Grace, then we help to empower them so that the indigenous people and leaders can indeed lead because that which was missing, which is support, tangible support, is made available. Um, if I can quickly tell one story about an orphan, uh, in, in March, in, in our March trip, we met uh, a four-year-old little girl named Giovanni Monjane. And uh, she's a little girl who, whose mother and sister grew up in Grace Village Orphanage. The mother got married. Uh, there are five children and a husband. And the mother and the little girl were both in the hospital in Port-au-Prince when the earthquake hit. Uh, the mother was killed in the earthquake and the little girl was buried for three days. She was physically rescued. She had a lifelong four years of uh, congenital heart disease, and, which is why she was in the hospital. And she was brought to Grace Village by her aunt, who not only had now grown up, but had become a teacher at Grace Village. We were introduced to her by the bishop's wife, and who told us that if we could just somehow get her corrective heart surgery, uh, we came back to the United States, and one of the doctors on our team, Dr. Aletha Maybank, called her Haitian friend, who is a cardiac surgeon in Indianapolis, Indiana, at Indiana University. And over a month, we worked vigorously to get all the paperwork together. And, and we're just excited to report that actually yesterday, she had successful corrective heart surgery yes. at the University of Indiana. Uh, in Indiana. Uh, the, the, the doctors 
told us that when they, they opened her up and looked at her heart, they could not believe that she survived this long. Her heart was in such disrepair. But they were able to make corrective surgery and she, not only expect, she is going to have a long and prosperous life. So at the same time, I get emails from people saying, can you help? There is a child who needs medical care. How do we get that child out of the country to the United States for care? Yes. And the navigating of the system, when it should be child needs medical care, and you're only a stone's throw from a great hospital in Miami, right. to me seems sort of a, a no-brainer. And yet it is, if, if people are emailing me for assistance in, in navigating this, I, I realize sort of their level of, of desperation. So it seems very touch and go. Somebody who knows somebody can get a child out. Somebody else who doesn't know as many people cannot. And, and on that on that point, though, there, just quickly, there there are a couple of organizations where there there are physicians who have a have a history and a commitment to not only providing care in Haiti, like the Association of Haitian Physicians Abroad and the National Medical Association, the Association of African American Physicians, both groups doing wonderful work, have a history of doing that in Haiti, but also have the connections and resources here in the states that, if contacted, we can help make those opportunities available for children. But the missing ingredient, <coughs> missing ingredient, ingredients rather, moving forward is nation building. Not to say that they... What they, do you mean they, by that? Well, exactly? I mean that the Haitian government has been broken, right? It is both broke and broken. And some of it has to do with a history of, of, of corruption or uh, authoritarianism. Under the Duvaliers, certainly nobody really wanted to support a dictatorship like that. And so what happened, what emerged historically was international aid organizations and indeed government supported NGOs. So now you have in Haiti what is many people call the Republic of NGOs. Somewhere between 10 and 14,000 NGOs are on the ground today. There was a similar situation in Rwanda, by the way, and, and there's, so there's some precedent for getting it corralled. So there needs to be, in this period of reconstruction, a way in which NGOs are certified, are qualified, and in fact work in concert with the government. Uh, because now, because that's what you expect the government to do. You can't starve the government and then expect somehow for things to be effective and smooth. So while the work of independent organizations like we do with the Haiti Support Project and others are important, in the coming period we must find ourselves working in concert with the government. And let me just say this, uh, with the government of President René Preval, uh, he has been criticized for some other things perhaps correctly. Uh, but the one thing we can say about his government is two things. Number one, he's lowered the political temperature so people from different political organizations now work together. The other thing is accountability and transparency. Very often our friends in the Haitian community are legitimately concerned about corruption. But with this particular government, no one has alleged that there's been a problem there. In fact, he's had to meet certain, the government has had to meet certain standards. So moving forward, it is going to be very important. and, and former President Clinton, who is working as the special envoy to Clinton and other, I mean, to, to uh, Haiti, and others have looked at Rwanda as one example of how the NGOs were pulled together and were coordinated in a way that they could be effectively working with the government. And it means that aid that is now coming in, as opposed to going around the government, must now come through the government so that, in fact, it can provide the kind of services that we expect of a government. Let's talk about race for a minute. Um, in our documentary, uh, in a later piece, you'll meet a woman named Amis Kubicki, a black woman who is a missionary and works at the lighthouse. And she talks about how important it is, and her personal philosophy is it's important for people of color to be seen working in Haiti. The reality on the ground is that there are not a lot of black missionaries. There are some, but percentage-wise, it's a much smaller percentage than white missionaries, and there are many. Why is that? I'll, I'll take a stab at that, <laughs> uh, because we are an, uh, an African-American predominantly um, supported in, in terms of people who go mm -hmm. and, and definitely owned uh, uh, medical missions organization. And everywhere that we have gone around the world, um, when we show up, since the places we're going are to take care of people of color, they are shocked and amazed that we're actually missionaries. What do they say? Who are you? Because we thought, by definition, missionaries were white. And so we bring um, a different perception of missions work 
and generate a tremendous amount of pride in the people that we're serving because they see themselves delivering service to themselves and it helps to empower them. I think one of the challenges that we've had as African Americans and people of color in our country is that our, str our struggle domestically has been so intense in trying to escape the, the, the clinches of, of poverty and deal with the issues of race that we have been consumed with our own survival and development. But we believe, um, not, not alone, but like others, that the best way to improve your own circumstances is to support someone else in their challenge. And so the reality is that as desperate as our plight has been in the United States, we're living as the example of somebody else's dream somewhere else in the world. As a matter of fact, most places in the world see poverty in America as something to ascend to. And it takes a global experience to really internalize that. So I think as more of us do missions work, and that means more of us people of color do missions work, bring back that experience, and open an opportunity for others to travel with us, they will likewise get a global perspective of how people live and what their their hope or hopelessness state is, and it will be much, much easier to connect by heart. Let me just say that uh, one of the, this, this is one of the reasons why 15 years ago we started the Haiti Support Project, because we really wanted uh, Haitians uh, to see people who look just like them who in, were involved in the process, and that is our unique niche. We, we don't try to organize the Haitian community, though we work with the Haitian community in partnerships, but we really try to bring the African American and other people of African descent to the table. And a part of that is to understand the history, and that's another thing we focus on, uh, because there has been tremendous rich engagement over the years uh, between African Americans and Haitians. Uh, this dear friend of mine out of Pittsburgh, Dr. Leon Pamphill, has a, a book out, a very, very provocative book called uh, Haitians and African Americans, uh, a legacy, a heritage of tragedy and hope, in which he talks about it. So Frederick Douglass, for example, was the first ambassador from the United States to Haiti, I mean, and broke the chain, and, I mean, and really was very strong in supporting Haiti. The NACP uh, was the most, one of the strongest supporters of Haiti. Uh, Walter White and uh, W.B. Du Bois and, and James Weldon Johnson for many, many, many years. And there are major denominations, the, uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church and others that do have missions in Haiti uh, that are doing work. But it seems to me that it's much more than, I mean, for me, missionary is a broader term because I'm a faith person, but you know, one of the problems of missionaries, too, is that both African missionaries and black missionaries, I mean, white missionaries sometimes, do come and want to change the culture. For example, I heard someone stand up the other day and talked about the fact that they had saved someone from voodoo, a voodoo. I'm not really trying to save Haitians from voodoo, because that's a part of the fabric of their culture also. And so it needs to be really compatible in that regard. So I think we need to tell the story. I just got back with a delegation of uh, African-American journalists, including people like Joe Madison, the Black Eagle, Hazel Trice Etney, the, um, uh, the editor-in-chief of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, 200 black newspapers across the country, Richard Muhammad, the Final Call newspaper, uh, and Herb Boyd with Free Speech Television. Those stories have been resonating all across the country, introducing black people, people of African descent, to Haiti. And so that's what we've been doing. We will continue to do that because we have to build this partnership, but it has to be a respectful partnership uh, based on respect, genuine and authentic respect for Haitian culture and socially responsible development at all levels, whether it's dealing with orphanages, whether it's economic development, which is a big issue that we need to deal with. So I think it's coming. I think that it, there, is, there has been a history of it. I think more of that is to come in terms of the engagement of people of African descent with Haiti. In the rebuilding of Haiti, do you see a change in, for example, rest of X, the rest of X situation. Is that something that will be changed as there is reconstruction, rebuilding, money pouring in? Is there a correlation there? Uh, can I say just a little something about the last sure, question? Because yeah. this is so important. <laughs> you can I answer respect. both. <laughs> uh, we have been uh, doing the ministry in Haiti for more than 35 years. And like you said, we have seen more of the, uh, or the American Christians, you know, helping. But I would say, like you said, it's coming. I'm so glad to say that we have seen more African-American organizations 
coming in, and uh, we are partnering with uh, more churches than before, and that's why we feel so good partnering with uh, Dr. Wade and Horizon Work Ministry because their commitment is a long, long-range commitment. Yes. I said, we want to take you from there and bring you up to there. So we, uh, we want to say thank you to everybody that helped and also to the uh, African-American organizations that are really engaged now in helping the Haitian people. And I wanted to say that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Now, I'll let you do that, that question. <laughs> Why don't we start with the history? Tell us about Restivex, uh, the, the, the background in Restivex. And then as we move forward with rebuilding, is that something that is going to potentially change? Well, I'm going to yield to the bishop on that one, and then I'll come back on the policy side. The, the history of Restivex. Uh, the history of restoration? No, Restivex. A child slavery in Haiti. Just Vic, okay. <laughs> Your Creole. That's I, I it. thought, I thought, <laughs> I thought not it what was it should an, be. an English word. <laughs> Restavec. <clears throat> yes, Restavec, that has been a long, long, long time, you know. Uh, Restavec means, uh, reste avec means uh, uh, stay with. It's like somebody bring you a child they just stay with you there is no government paper nothing they just stay with you and and the mentality that restavec is supposed to do all the work in the house there is a big big kid which is the 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 son of the father and the mother and that little restavec is supposed to bring water for him or for her cook the food and go to market and do everything and she has to do that because that's the way she or he going to own uh, her life. So uh, many times they are beating, they are just very much mistreated. But the thing is, they have nowhere to go. If they leave, some of them go and live in cemeteries. Like in Gonaive, there have been lots of children living right in the cemeteries. But they have to get out of the cemetery to go do some work for some people so they can have some food. So uh, unfortunately, we have not had any legislation, you know, about, you know, how to treat those children. And the government has had some centre d'accueil, some center to, to receive some children, but never been enough, you know, to take care of all those children that need help and orphanages as negative some of them might be but they are doing what they can and there are so many more so Restavec is really a situation that uh, uh, need to be addressed and uh, I, I don't know when that will be ended but as organization Christian organization that taking care of children we are certainly working towards putting an end to that, and we are doing all we can, and all of you out there that's helping in that, let's get together and make it happen. God created everybody equal, and children need to be protected. Is there a chance with all the focus on Haiti and money coming in and people looking to rebuild that the rest of that situation will change? Well, I think there are two problems. One, I think the government has to launch a major campaign around the issue. And I know there are people who talk about it, and there's been some discussion about it, but this has to be front and center as a major priority. And, and the reason I say that is because it's become ingrained to some degree within the Haitian culture, uh, in the sense that many of the people who give up their children don't give them up in a negative sense. They give them up, I think, as you, we were talking earlier, because they, they want the child to have a better way of life. And they somehow believe if they give up the child, that it will be better than the circumstance that they find themselves in now, or because of resources, which are a pittance, really. So it's a real tragedy, uh, which has to be worked on. And so it seems to me there's an integral relationship between the social and economic development that has to take place and the education that has to take place in order to end this uh, system. But it must end. 
because obviously you cannot have a modern society and, 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 and have this kind of uh, practice continue. So I think it's going to take those kinds of uh, systemic efforts. I think it is on the radar screen of, of the government, and I think there's major pressure coming from also international organizations that this has to end. And I, and I would like to add that oh, over 70 percent of the world's population is in poverty. Not, not what we call poverty. I mean having nothing. And it's not doing one thing or the other. It's doing all of it. We absolutely have to address uh, laws and establish governmental policies. But we can't legislate righteousness. People don't do right things just because there's a law. Uh, children don't vote. So they don't have an opportunity to weigh in on how the laws should be written to protect themselves. So that in, in the provision of services, we need to develop examples and then display those examples to the world. And that new Haiti cannot be, I don't want to talk about rebuild, it must be a new Haiti. And a part of that must be to address the child welfare system, including the issue of child uh, slavery. And so, but the economic, under, the underlying reality of a, a thriving economy is something that it seems to me is an indispensable ingredient in that formula. And so we, we need the both private and public institutions that will address these issues. But at the base of it, there is a need for a thriving economy. And I know that's a part of the, 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 the plan that's on the table now. But, you know, we have to see how it's implemented and how inclusive it will be in terms of the various sectors to drive it and move it forward. So the, the po poverty, yes, it is a global problem. And yes, we have to address poverty. But we do that by identifying ways that even in the most desperate, desperate of circumstances and environments, like Haiti today, that even those who are in this state of poverty can, from the resources that God has around them, teach them how to become self-sufficient and masters of their own destiny. Right now, people need to move from off the ground into temporary housing, and from temporary housing to permanent housing. What, the question is, well, how's that gonna happen? People don't have jobs. If you just build them a house, six months from now, they won't be able to maintain it. So the process of moving them engages them, employs them through sweat equity and pay to build their house and the houses in their community. That's the, the project that we're unfolding at Grace as an example. You, you train them so that, train them how to identify and grow the resources that become the builder material because Haiti's soil can grow bamboo and other materials that can be transformed into walls and floors. It's teaching them how to establish uh, of energy by building a house that has solar panels that doesn't require an electric company, that can generate enough energy in their own home that if the government, when the government is ready, they can sell energy back to the government as opposed to have to buy it. So there, there are many, many ingenious and available ways to make a poor nation, a poor community, a poor individual self-sufficient and prosperous, but those and those opportunities have to be made public, availed. They need to get the type of, of, of press, if you will, that the negative things do. And, and so that's what Horizon Walk is trying to do with, with Grace International is to show a very, very positive initiative that literally brings people out of poverty into prosperity and have people want to say, well, how does this work? Ask the question. Then you get people willing to invest in successes rather than in traditional, what often becomes black holes. Yeah, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't disagree with that. And we certainly, as the Haiti Support Project, have some innovative individual projects. And we hope that some of them will be adopted. The operative term is public. And that is to say that these examples, and that's why I applaud what uh, Bishop Lejeune is doing, because at the end of the day, those models must become public. They must be policy. Because it cannot, it, NGOs are doing great innovative things now. There are all kind of great innovative eyes out there. They're clashing. They're, they're, some are working, some are not working. And it has to be coordinated. It has to be systemic. And it, therefore, that's why having a viable government becomes important. Because all of the heroism we do individually is going to be great. And we will rescue some. But in order for it to ultimately be successful, it is a systemic issue. And again, it must be public, as in a government 
must be strong enough. And that's a part of the plans. There are plans now to de decentralize. There are, there are plans to create magnets. And certainly the ideas about solar energy, sustainable ag industries, all those are a part of the plan that's on the ground now. I think the missing element may well be whether or not the government can inspire and encourage the nation as a whole to become engaged in the process and that there's enough flexibility to tap the, because the Haitian building people, if they're anything, are resilient. I mean, I was there in a tent city uh, about a month after this occurred. I saw uh, uh, six students, just like the students we have at York College, when they were medical students, who came in. They began to do medical practices and procedures. People began to, to join with them in that, uh, in that enterprise. Before it was over, there were 800 families, 3,500 people who organized themselves into a community with four distinct neighborhoods, elected their own committees, and then they're governing themselves. So that's the strength of the Haitian people. You saw, you know, like a earth, like a, a forest fire that sort of scorches the earth. But almost within a month or so, you, you've been there, you saw the shoots coming in. People are back getting busy. The question is, can that be tapped? Can that be harnessed? around all of the innovative ideas that we're talking about. And that's why, again, it's not that I'm such a great proponent of the government per se, but when we understand how starved and how weak the Haitian government has been made, so to speak, then it, that, that's an integral part of the equation. The Haitian government must be strong enough in order to be able to implement many of these programs. What's the timeline? This will be my last question. I'm going to have people come up to the mics to ask questions. Uh, what's the, when do people, when do we see real change? Not from programs that work and are great models to people adopting those models, from a government that uh, has some hope and shoots coming out the months after to a stronger government that is working in conjunction with its people to build a real infrastructure? I'd say we see it, we can see it immediately. And, and, and by the way, I'm in, in total agreement with the points made um, by my fellow panelists. We're not talking about either or. We, we need it all. We need government strengthened, and we need projects that the government can adopt and say, this is what we support, and the resources that are coming into our country, we want to replicate this model. Right now, we, we are at a point where the rainy season has begun. The reality is, though, in, in my estimates, over half a million people have died in this, as a result of this earthquake. It's just the tipping point about of what's going to happen if we don't put in some measures to prevent an epidemic of infectious disease that is inevitable. But we can, but we have to do some things now. We have to move people who are living by the hundreds of thousands in ten cities and in the street out of the path of rainwater, sewage, waste that is going to, that is going to be washed into their living space and cholera and, and denudes uh, uh, diseases, et cetera, which are not only devastating, but fatal. And do you see it, that happening? It can, it, can be, it can happen by moving people into, into temporary structures that then, once you move them out of the temporary structure into a permanent home, that temporary structure is then turned into the school, the hospital, et cetera. And this is what I mean about examples of how to do it now. We need to strengthen our government, and, and by the way, our group is going to be meeting next week with some of the top government officials to present this program so that we will get governmental support because we agree in the con concepts that were shared. But we cannot afford, when I say we, I'm talking about those of us who believe in Haiti, love the people, and are Haitian, cannot afford to wait until the perfect governmental intervention is manifest because hundreds of thousands of people will die if we don't do something now. And the what to do is already off the drawing board and ready to be funded, but financial support has to happen. Yes, uh, we want to work with the government, but as um, doctor said, we cannot wait because since January 12, the first couple of weeks, we had more than 10,000 people on our ground, and it grew now to almost 25,000 people. Every space is taken on our ground. But as of today, we have not seen one 
government official to come by and said, what are you doing with all these people? How can we help? Can we help with something? So if we don't do it and we wait for the government, the government itself said it will be after three years when they will do the cleaning. After three years, many people will die. So in our situation on Grace Village now, the government asked, required that school start. We have no inch to put even tent to have our school. So we really have to move, not only for the rainy season, but to relocate some of the people so we can have at least a place to put our tent to start school for our children. It's like an emergency. So funding is really needed yesterday, and we need to go forward as much as soon as possible. What does the timeline look like to you, Dr. Daniels? Well, I, I, you know, that's a very difficult question because I think sometimes it's hard for people to grasp the magnitude of this crisis, uh, and even the magnitude of the government dealing with this. And again, I'm not trying to be an apologist for the government, but you know, you had, um, I forget how many ministries that were almost totally destroyed. It's not as if uh, they, the president and the prime minister could, could uh, retreat to a secure bunker like Bush and Cheney. I mean, th th there was total devastation of many of these ministries. So the government itself has had to be rebuilt. But I think they're inching forward as I check with people on the ground and we're leading another delegation the 18th through the 23rd to assess how progress is moving. Uh, I'm encouraged that the international community, uh, you know, the Haitian government asked uh, for four billion dollars over 18 months they got something like 10 billion dollars in commitments uh, over the next um, 10 years or, no, i'm sorry five years actually uh, so i'm encouraged that at least the money is going to be in the pipeline and a part of it is to fund the government itself its operations so that it can do the job in a much more effective way and i guess there's one other thing i want to say is that when you look at the haitian government it's like the top and the bottom you know you you have the leaders and then you have sort of people who are at the administrative level. There's huge spaces there in terms of middle level managers. And there's a huge cry out for the Haitian diaspora really to become engaged. And there's funding to get the Haitian diaspora in as middle level managers and so forth in order to beep up the government. So I think it's gonna be a slow progress, but I think that I'm encouraged that uh, it'll be incremental. I don't know what the timeline is. This is gonna be a long project. But the one thing I am encouraged by is I think the Haitian people are resilient, they are strong, and in some instances the government does kind of get, need to get out of the way and let the people just sort of move forward because that is the base, is the Haitian people and their culture is the greatest asset that Haiti has. Great, I'd like to open up to questions. We've got one right here, let's start here, and then we'll get to you next, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Olivier Noel from Queens College. Uh, I applaud your work, uh, the magnitude of the work in, for children in Haiti. Uh, when I was living in Haiti like two years ago, I've seen children in the street with uh, weapons, you know, guns, uh, completely corrupted by a, a specific political party. Uh, I'd like to know what do you think, uh, what are your thoughts about what the future of these children will be now that the political system is essentially not working anymore and uh, that the earthquake has struck Haiti. Thank you. I must say that uh, under the government of President Preval, they have done a great, great work cleaning the street from uh, weapons that the children had. So today it's very much different and some of these children have been taken to some homes so we don't have them with weapons in the street anymore. Let me just make a quick point on the political situation because I think that again, I, I started by saying I think one of the great things that President Preval has done it's what I call the reluctant president because he's not uh, the typical politician who, uh, you know, is a microphone in his face every minute. In fact, I think he doesn't do that enough. He doesn't communicate as well as he ought to in many respects. But he has lowered the political temperature in terms of bringing people into the political process who are a part of the opposition. And that's been good. Uh, and I think he's, uh, he also vigorously with the, U, uh, with the UN did begin to try to bring peace and tranquility to some degree uh, to places uh, where life was uh, somewhat dangerous. But I am also concerned, however, that, that, uh, that as the development plan has been, uh, has been put forward, there are a number of grassroots organizations on the ground who have 
who have ideas to contribute, who feel that they were not in the process. And so I hope that the pattern that President Preval has set of inclusiveness will continue because you, know, you have peasant organizations, women organizations, youth organizations who are on the ground who've just not been consulted sufficiently. And, and I wrote an article about that recently. I spread it around. I don't know what influence I have, but I am concerned that you could, the clock could be turned back because if people don't feel like they're included sufficiently, then there's alienation and then that holds back the process. I would say, you remember, children are children are children all over the world. They're the same, and they're the same here in the United States. Desperate people do desperate things. Children don't, aren't born to carry guns to shoot people, to rob people. What they're seeking is love. And so we need to provide them some options. We need to provide these children an option for school, an option for job training, an option to, to be a part of a family an option to be around people who have a vision bigger than those who gave them the guns. So we, we have to take a very, very practical and personal responsibility of interacting with children one at a time. That's right. Next question right here. Hello, my name is Peter. My name is Werner. And uh, we know that uh, you all uh, did good things to help the community in Haiti such as like uh, making orphanages. But how can we as kids who want to make a difference uh, help? Like, Okay, first of all, I love the two, two per question. <laughs> I don't think I've ever experienced that before, ever, and it was fabulously well done. Thank you, gentlemen. And I'll open it up to our panel. People ask that all the time. So, so how do you help? You see the story of an orphanage. You see uh, people who want to get to the next level. What do you do for people who don't necessarily know who to write a check to or okay. who to invest in? Okay, as we, Grace International, we are doing the orphanage, helping the orphans to orphanages, but we partner with this ministry here, mm -hmm. the Rise and Work. Mm -hmm. So anyone that wants to help with anything we have said here, you can get to Arise and Work Ministries and uh, get the information and then they will get to us, certainly. This is a ministry that has been helping uh, beyond expectation. So, yeah. well, we, we certainly have Thank the you. Haiti Support uh, Project and we have a relief fund that people can support. In fact, when we go to Haiti in a couple of weeks, we're going to be making our first grants out of our relief fund to various organizations on the ground. However, I think it's particularly exciting to hear young people who want to help, and, and that's uh, incredibly important. I have, one of these days, I'd like to see Toussaint Louverture brigades, you know, be organized. There's a young man in the audience, however, his name is uh, uh, um, uh, Adele Regis. Uh, he has created an organization called Rise Again Haiti. Adele, are you here? All right. <laughs> see that, this young man, his, and I take some credit for him because he's come up through some of our work and his, his sister worked with us for many, many years. A very brilliant young man who's trying to organize thousands of students and young people across this country to do all kinds of things. I mean, you can, you can, you can, you can have projects in your school, but you need to shoot it through a credible organization. So I point to him because on our website, we list them as a credible organization, Rise Again Haiti. And with your support, young people, Haiti is going to rise again. Thanks for the question. May, may, I, may I weigh in on that, oh, ahead, that question? Uh, young men, no one has the ability to pull on the heartstrings and the pocketbooks of adults like children. <laughs> when you talk about Haiti in school, at church, in the community, and when you say, we need to do something, Mom, Dad, you, you need to make sure that the, the guys playing basketball are, 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 are supporting organizations that, that can do something. We listen. And so you are in a unique position, though you might not have the financial resources to make the difference, you are able to impact those of us who can make a difference in a very unique way. Do not underestimate your power to move adults to get things done. And if you happen to like the work that we're talking about, our website is <laughs> www.awm, 
foundation.org. We will manifest what we've talked about proportional to the financial support we receive. It's that simple. Great, thank you. Next question. Hi, how you doing? My name is Zalun Darilas, the president of the Haitian Club at Kingsborough Community College. Um, my question is, um, how can we open a, like an organization in a suburb to keep the children home? Because um, I was raised in Haiti, so I know under all the suburb where the family don't have anything, so they want to send the children in port au to have a better future where port au is packed up already. Why don't we create something that will make them stay, an opportunity that will make them stay back in the suburb where they could be safe with their family? Well, that's a part of what Haiti has to do. Has to do. I mean, there is decentralization is one of the critical parts of the development plan. Uh, Port-au-Prince must never ever be allowed to grow to the size that it is today, and I don't think there's any intention of that happening. However, for that to uh, to be realized, um, there's some tensions because there is a something called Hope One and Hope Two that have incentivized the manufacturing sector. And that is a prescription for getting people to come for to what some of us believe are only sweatshops again. So I'm a little nervous about that because that's what drove people to Port-au-Prince in the first place. However, if, if in fact, as uh, Dr. Wade has said, there are these magnets, and that's a part of what's being talked about, sus magnets, sustainable communities yes. with agriculture as the base. Haiti is the only one of the Caribbean nations left that has a majority of people who still live in the rural areas. And so you've got to, you know, the, the Ottomani Valley could raise enough rice to feed the entire Caribbean, but it was undermined by U.S. policy. President Clinton recently admitted that, that his own state of Arkansas was involved in helping to undermine it. So we have to have sustainable policies in terms of agriculture. One of the things we're going to do when we go down this time is that we tell people to send money very often, because if you send money as opposed to sending food and you help people to grow food, we're going to support the seeds program that's, that's uh, developing there. Then people, the farmers will grow the food and then the people can buy the food and that helps to stimulate the economy internally. So, 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 we, so the, the short answer is we have to support the Haitian government and NGOs and so forth in creating these sustainable communities that are decentralized away from Port-au-Prince so that people will stay. And I must say, we went through the tent cities and communities and people were saying that. I only came to hate Port-au-Prince because I didn't have a job. If I, if I could have had a job where I, um, where I was living, I would have stayed there. So that's got to be an objective, and I think that almost everybody's on the same page in trying to get that done. Through our program in uh, the 270 churches we have throughout Haiti, we try to have school because many of them, when they don't have school where they are, they send them out. So we try to keep them there and bringing school to them and also be, be, with creating some programs like organic kind of uh, food or things that can be sold out to keep them where they are. So we have been addressing that problem, but we need to do much more to keep, uh, to do it. Because we have so many questions and we don't have a lot of time, what I'll do is have, we'll go through, I'll shorten our questions and we'll get short Smart answers from our panel and then we'll try to get everybody in. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Lindbergh Salson. I have two English names, but I'm 100% Asian American. So I was in the stage April 11 to acting, to raise money to stay with a J.C. Gilbert, L.C. Gilbert to send money to Haiti. But I live 43 years in America. So I hear everybody talking. I hear the minister. I hear everybody. But you have a proverb say, when you give somebody something to eat, he eats one day. When you show him how to fishing, he eats every day. Yes, it is what we need because by coffee, sugar cane, cotton, cacao, banana, when you make plantation, everybody can eat because the, the people want to eat first. 
Excellent. And, and you want the job. Want the job. Thank you for your comments. I'm going to stop the, you there because we have a lot of people no, to no, get to. No, no, the minister say, <laughs> why the people have Restavec? Because he don't have job. He, he send the people to some place. The children can have some, something to eat. But you know the Restavec? Uh, uh, that's what happened. And Thank you very much. I'm going to stop you there. I appreciate your comment and your... <laughs> well, we can turn off your mic, though, which is actually <laughs> how we might do it and move over here because we want to get to everyone, sir, so I'm going to stop you if you don't mind. No, I'm so sorry, but it's the interviewers. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate them greatly. We'll move over here. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jean Leslie Stenville, and uh, I am the president of Rescue One Child. It's a nonprofit organization working here in New York, and uh, we are also working with uh, about 100 children in Haiti. And uh, the question that I have tonight is, how the small organizations can be part of the network so we can be effective. Because one of the problems that a lot of people have, they have responsibility in Haiti, but because they, they are small organization, they cannot really reach out and help. I help a lot of uh, organization to raise money here but a lot of people, you reach out to them, they say that, well, I want to give money to Red Cross. And when you call home, they say that Red Cross never get where they are. But we are organization, we have all the papers, but we don't have the network so we can get together and be effective as the other organization are being effective. I've heard this complaint a lot, and this I'll give this to you, Dr. Daniels, to try to frame, because a number of, of people who run small organizations have said exactly the same thing, that if you don't have a big name and, and people don't know you, you don't get the financial resources, and you can't do the work in the neighborhoods where you're already ensconced. What do you do? Well, well I, think, I think there are several things. Number one, uh, people are, do want to see the books. I mean, people are concerned with, you know, how much of the money raised by the Red Cross and other organizations has actually gone into Haiti. About two billion has actually been raised all told. I think US-based US organizations have raised a billion dollars. Uh, and some of us are very nervous about the Red Cross because of uh, bad taste around Ka Katrina. But I think here again, uh, there are organizations like the ones that are sitting here who can try to be helpful. Uh, I also think that this is an, a task that the Haitian government has to take, uh, undertake because it, has to, it needs to register all of the NGOs so that they can manifest what their needs are and then see whether those needs can be met. And I must also say this, I mean again, Haiti has 10,000 to 14,000 NGOs. Maybe small is good, but maybe we also need to talk about how do we collaborate. How do we collaborate? How do we combine two or three of our organizations together so we can be more effective in our outreach? Because it's hard to service so many organizations. Great, thank you. I'm going to move on to the question over here. I don't know. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Marie Carmel Hawanchi. Uh, I'm a nurse practitioner, and a week after the earthquake, I did go down to Haiti, and the news media was mainly focusing on Port-au-Prince. But however, you have a lot of other areas were seriously affected and they had no help. There's a lot of people who donated stuff, and at this present time, they don't know who to give it to. The government is asking a lot of money to get the stuff there and also to help the people. So I want to know, is there any uh, network or connection so that people who have stuff to donate, like I have people who donate medication, uh, chairs, beds. However, it's so costly to ship the things down there. And when you get down there, you have to pay the course to get the stuff out. And they need a lot of medical help, medical supply, and there's a need to control the practitioners who are going down there who don't have medical credentials who are practicing under Haitian. I saw it uh, firsthand, and I think there's a need to follow up on those issues. Okay, let's start with the first part, which is so many people want to help, and then the actual logistics of getting help in sure. is very challenging. Particularly when we talk about so many people with particularly with large items or big bulk that's, that's expensive in order to ship. 
There happens to be a, an organization represented here in the audience. Uh, Mr. Stan Neuron is head of New Jersey for Haiti. Uh, and he is a, his group is the central point of collecting. Could he stand if he's in the audience? Mr. Neuron. Right there. And he has done a yeoman's job of collecting hundreds of millions of dollars worth of from, from stretchers and wheelchairs to clothes, et cetera. And they have a connection with the UN to be able to ship these items for free. So I would say, don't send them to a rising wall. Send them to New Jersey for Haiti because he has a mechanism in okay. place and, and he's, he'll be available to, to bring those connections. And that's the teamwork that we're talking about. We only have about. time for one last question. So we're gonna, I'm sorry, um, and hopefully you'll get a chance to talk to the panelists as we, uh, as we end here. Um, your brilliant student, I believe, yes. is right here. So we'll end with you, sir. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening. First and foremost, my name is Adal Regis. I'm the president of Rising and AD Incorporated, uh, which is an organization that's aiming to mobilize students and professionals from universities to s sponsor them and send them to Haiti to do some volunteer work. And I promise I'll keep this brief. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, my question is this. I had a chance to go to Haiti uh, three weeks ago along with my colleague who's actually in, um, within the room. And we had a chance to survey people. I had a chance to meet government officials, actually one of the ministers as well, and from what we got is that um, there's a lot of people that's going to Haiti and not doing work, and I, I am a strong support, uh, supporter of diversity, strength and diversity meaning receiving aid from people of different backgrounds, because with diversity comes creativity. But my concern now is that, um, and Dr. Daniels actually brought this before, how can we actually educate the people that are coming to Haiti so that, um, educate the culture so that they don't come and necessarily, you know, come and more kind of change the game. What I mean by that is there's been a clash between um, Haitian doctors, for example, and the Haitian um, and American doctors are saying, this is the way, right way to do it. And so because of ego issues, the work can't be done properly down there, which is a big problem. So now um, Haitian doctors are being left out or Haitian engineers are being left out because some people are coming from different places, different countries and saying, this is all we to do it and all we to do is the right way. It's so, interesting. I'll stop. I'm mm -hmm. going to shorten your question for you a little sure. bit, if you will. And, and this is not only specific to Haiti. This is any place I have gone anywhere. When people come in, they bring with them their value system and they often try to then implant it on wherever they are. It's, it's a clash sometimes. How do you both get the aid and yet minimize the clashing? Go ahead, Dr. Wade. Uh, the mechanism that we use is that we come in to provide a support. So we empower through training, the provision of the resource, the provision of the opportunity to, and I'll use this example, the Haitian community. So that we, we use the Haitian translators, the Haitian medical staff to be a part of our team so that we ensure that we are as sensitive as possible because they are the face of the work that's being done, not a rising wall. When we're talking about the building project, we're only, we will only have Americans involved to teach the Haitian population how to do it. It becomes the, a, a Haitian program, source of employment, it's empowerment, which means we Americans have to give up the power in order to empower somebody else. And we found that to be most effective in gaining the support and respect of those that we've come to help. Dr. Wade, that'll be our final answer for this evening. I want to thank the audience. We certainly appreciate you this afternoon. And also, of course, to our panelists, Dr. Wade and, and Bishop and Professor Daniels. Thank, thank you very much. much.